everyone, it's Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vet, welcoming you to another episode of Vet Chat, the UK's number one veterinary podcast. And I'm very pleased to be able to welcome today Neil Forbes, who is a veterinary surgeon uh, famous for his love and care for exotic animals when he was the owner of the Great Western Referral Centre down in Swindon. But we're going to be talking today about uh, a, a topic close to, I think, both of our hearts, but I know Neil's been doing a lot of work in this area, and that is the plight of the vulture. So uh, perhaps, Neil, before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about your history for those people who, who don't know who you are listening into the podcast. Okay, well, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Anthony, um, and good to be talking to all you guys out there. Um, okay, I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 1983, and like all the best veterinary, veterinary surgeons, commenced work in the Yorkshire Dales uh, up in Sedba. Um, and then uh, after 18 months, I moved from there, and uh, I was destined to be going down to the West Country, but then a job came up, um, which just happened to be uh, eight miles from Slimbridge Wildfire and Wetlands Trust, which was is the largest wildfire collection in Europe, and 15 miles from the International um, Bird of Prey Centre at Newent, um, and so that was that was the obvious choice for me. Um, I had a familial history in in birds, ornithology, and so on. My grandfather and his his brother were both very famous in the bird world. My grandfather is a, a falconer, and his brother is a wildfowl uh, research worker. Um, so uh, it was kind of in the genes. I couldn't help it. It's not my fault. Um, so I went to Swindon and then in the fullness of time, 1992, I became a Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Specialist in Zoo and Wildlife Brackets Avian. And then in 1996, became a European College Specialist uh, and on we go. And then I moved from Stroud to Swindon in 2004, we set up the Great Western Referral Centre and I was head of the exotic service, the Great Western Exotics. We had five clinicians just doing exotic animal medicine. Had a lovely time. Um, but yes, as Anthony says, vultures is very much um, a, a real penchant, a hobby horse if you like. Um, and it's true to say that vultures are the most endangered group of birds uh, in the world. Uh, and it's been going on for a long, long time and they're really struggling. Um, and I see myself as as very, very lucky, really, that, I mean, I think it's true to say that veterinary surgeons, through their careers and their work, often have tremendous numbers of different skills that can be applied to conservation, to humanity projects, all sorts of things around the world. Uh, and I think it's great that for those of us who may be retired a little bit earlier or maybe just feeling very fit at a retirement age, can apply some of those skills for the benefit of whether it be wildlife or, or um, developing countries or human calamities and so forth. And so in my situation, uh, through my career, I, one of my interests has been orthopedic work, avian orthopedic work. Um, and I was already traveling to Africa and uh, had opportunity to meet with Volpro, which is the main re vulture rehabilitation um, facility in South Africa and realized just how dreadful the whole situation was um, and that I had skills and knowledge and experience that would allow me to hopefully make a difference mm -hmm. to yeah. the potential extinction of a number of species. I think the interesting thing that you said there, Neil, was, um, you know, whether it be for conservation, for people, for whatever, but as I think we all get a bit older and wiser, we realise all of this is connected anyway, holistically. If we get rid of the vultures, as we saw in India, there was a rise in yeah. the number of dogs on the streets. And of course, rabies went up, which was a human um, disease, obviously affecting dogs as well. But uh, many more deaths happened because we were upsetting the, the, the equilibrium, so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you know, everything uh, has found its own niche in the UK, in the ecosystem um, over centuries of evolution and, and development. And uh, nature hates a vacuum if you take one element out. So you mentioned the, the Asian vulture crisis. And just to remind people, 
This was first noticed in the end of last century, so about 1999. Um, and they, in India, they lost 99.9% .9 of all the vultures over a 20 year period. So you may say, well, 20 years, that's a long time. Actually, in, in conservation terms, that's quite a short time. So a, fan, a, a tremendous crash in the vulture population. And as you mm -hmm. rightly said, that, that meant because the vulture, vultures are uh, euphemistically referred to as nature's cleanup crew. They're there to eat rubbish, uh, rotting meat, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And as we all know, they have the ability of eating anthrax and botulism and salmonella and nasty E. coli and so on and neutralizing it. So they do nature and, hu and, and human populations a tremendous service in terms of cleaning up. 70% of the dead carcasses on the Maasai Mara in Kenya are consumed by vultures. So if all of a sudden mm. those vultures aren't there, someone else is going to eat that meat. In Africa, it seems to be the pied crows. Uh, in Asia, it was certainly, as you say, the feral dogs. And the feral dogs increased, and we had an increase of, uh, it was published as 600,000 additional rabies deaths uh, on an annual basis uh, just simply because of the, the the loss of the vultures so yeah it and you know this concept of one health that people are more and more interested in and and it really is very very valid that we can't think of ourselves as the top dog and we'll do what we like to this uh, system that we live in uh, it, it does all interact with each other, you know, whether we're talking about food or animals or ourselves, COVID, etc. cetera, um, even influenza around the corner, maybe, um, you know, we do interact with everyone. And we, we if we ignore it, um, you know, we, we will come to regret it. That's, that's sure. our peril. Absolutely. And it, it seems such a shame that vultures can cope with all of those bugs and yet with a non-steroidal drug that goes into that's their true. system through yeah. eating... Um, you know, a carcass, a cattle carcass, that, that is almost, you know, it, it ensures its death, doesn't it? That's right. So so basically what happened, they, so they discovered the, the, the population crash in 1999. It was 2004, um, an American research worker uh, discovered that um, the vultures were dying of kidney failure. And that was then put down to diclofenac, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And over time, we've come to appreciate that vultures are killed by the vast majority of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, meloxicam being an exception. Um, and there is just one other uh, non-steroidal they found recently, which, which is safe for vultures. So basically, as you say, if a carcass, whether that be human or uh, animal, because in India, the, uh, the Parsi sect uh, use what they call sky burials. They have a tower and they strap carcasses to the tower and the vultures would then consume the carcass. Um, and mm. you know, whether you believe in, in what the Parsi like to do or, or not, it, it doesn't matter. The point is that for thousands of years, that sect in India has disposed of their dead in that way. And then because of the vulture loss, they couldn't. And, and you know, that's just such a fundamental thing. Um, hmm. So, yes, it had a big a big effect on there. But, um, you know, the good news is with, with India, uh, although politically it's very difficult to ensure that non-steroidals are really, really removed from the... Um, the supply market in India. Um, it has predominantly been done and they've set up captive breeding stations in Nepal and in India and Pakistan. Um, and those are being successful now. Um, there's a, a lot of tremendous work um, by the RSPB and the Institute of Zoology in London, uh, working with, with others out there and, and they've turned it around and it'll be many, many years before it gets back to what it was. And I think at this point, it's perhaps worth just sharing with you the productivity of vultures, which is one of the vulture family's great problems. They lay one egg a year, just one egg, and they rear one chick every other year. So, and they're not mature until they're five or six years old. So it means that if anything happens, you know, species of these types are much more susceptible to, uh, to threats to their population because they don't have the ability to uh, build their population numbers back up quickly enough. Um, 
There are obviously ways to do it in captivity. Uh, if they lay one egg, we can actually uh, leave that egg with the parents perhaps for 10 days just to, to help the, uh, fer- you know, the, obviously it's fertilized, but to help the early development uh, happening. And then we can move it into an artificial incubator. And by doing that before 14 days, um, we will actually trigger the mum, the hen, to lay a second egg. Um, and then, of course, when the first egg hatches, we flip that back underneath mum and take out the second egg and then hopefully get the second. And, and there have been some very mm-hmm. successful experiments now. I was talking to someone yesterday about uh, bearded vultures in Europe, um, where they've actually persuaded mum and dad bearded vulture to have two nests and, and have an, a, a chicken each each nest so that they've actually been able to double a hundred percent increase in the production rate mm. of captive bearded vultures. So there are some great things that we can be doing, but that that's really why vultures have such a challenge. But to say India, although it was terrible, in all honesty, it was pretty straightforward to sort it out. That's a terrible under underestimation. But it, it mm. you know it's something that can it's, be sorted. It's... Africa is totally different. Yeah, this this head starting I think is is useful for a lot of. Um species isn't it that are endangered to to really give them a a helping hand um i I suppose the problem is that as you said in india it has been a relatively straightforward problem to solve i know or not not relatively straightforward it's been difficult i know nepal reading i'm an avid reader of the bbc wildlife magazine and nepal was seen as a real uh, sentinel that that really started the process off for india as well didn't it yeah, yeah, yeah. Very successful with the breeding, and um, of course, one of the great challenges is you. If you are, I was going to say captive breeding. Nowadays, we like to refer to it as conservation breeding. Um, if you are doing that, then according to the IUCN guidelines, you shouldn't be releasing the captive bred youngsters back to the wild unless the wild environment is safe from the danger that caused the crash in the first place. Um, and that has been a little bit of a problem yeah. in some of the areas of Asia. Um, but, but as I say, generally speaking, that is sorted. And, you know, it may take 15, 20 years to get populations um, sort of up and stable and, and a lot longer to back to how they were. Um, but, uh, but as I say... In- interestingly, is- um, Neil, just going back to the Parsi tribe, if they were taking non-steroidals was that affecting the vultures as well yes that's why i mentioned is it because it was consuming any carcass whether that be human or animal that was had recently been uh medicated with uh diclofenac um, or other non-steroidal anti-inflammatories it would have the same effect and it did have the same effect as you said um neil in some ways, relatively straightforward, get rid of the non-steroidals and things should improve and obviously use meloxicam uh, as the drug of choice when you're treating cattle or whatever. Africa is a lot more difficult, isn't it? Because I know I was reading an article about the poachers actually poison the vultures because they don't yeah. want the vultures to warn the guards that they've just poached something. So how how what other factors are coming in place? To, to make it more yeah. complicated in Africa. We, we add that bit into the story as we come through, but I think the important thing for people to appreciate is that the African vulture population has been declining for 60 years. Okay, It's not a new thing. It's a very old thing. And it isn't one cause. It's a number of causes. So, And the, the, the instance of different causes does vary from one area of, of uh, Africa to another. But in essence, we have conflict with power generation. So that means uh, being electrocuted on power lines, flying into power lines, or hitting, these days, hitting uh, wind uh, turbines. And that is responsible. ESCOM itself, who is the government-owned electricity producing company in South Africa, they they put their hand up. uh, uh, They've told me this face-to-face in a meeting um, in, in Johannesburg. They are responsible for 34% of all the vulture deaths. Um, and that that's a, a horrific figure. Um, mm. And although you know they're redesigning pylons to try and get the wires further away from the actual pylon so that the chance of a bird extending its wing and actually, while standing on a 
power cable touch the pylon or vice versa. Uh, they've, they've done that bit of it, um, but they haven't um, put enough scarers on the, on the wires so that vultures see the wires and don't fly into the wires. So there's a tremendous amount more they could be doing. But the reality is ESCOM is a bankrupt government-owned company, you know? Um, if it were a privately owned company, I can guarantee they would have been taken to court and sued to hell and back. Um, but you just simply can't do it. It's not effective. So anyway, power generation is one thing. Second thing is black magic, what is referred to as mutti. So unfortunately, um, somewhere around 30% of, of, uh, of deaths is caused by local people um, killing on purpose vultures so that vulture body parts can be consumed, either eaten or smoked, uh, because this will allow them to see into the future. Now, if you sleep with a, either an owl or a vulture head under your pillow, you'll wake up knowing the lottery numbers for next Friday evening, and instantly you'll be a, a millionaire, mm. um, and this sort of thing. And so... You know, the when when we're talking about black magic, what we're talking about is not just seeing into the future, but also um, health, recovering from nasty diseases, whether it be malaria or AIDS or whatever. Um, and you can say, well, that's ridiculous. But again, think about it. These people have had faith in the black magic doctor for generation after generation after generation. Even though they have access to Western medicine and Western doctors, and going to see a Western doctor is cheaper than going to see a black magic doctor, 80% of local people still choose to go to see a black magic doctor. And the black magic doctor mm. wants these body parts because that's part of his healing process. So that's 30% yeah. due to that. And then, as you rightly say, we have poisoning. Now, there's always been a bit of accidental poisoning. So that's where the farmer is putting out bait, poison bait, to try and kill lion, jackal, hyena. In other words, species of wildlife that are putting his farm stock at risk. And although you and I can criticise that and say it's awful, these are subsistence farmers who are trying to feed their family. And mm. you can you know, understand why there's a problem. Um, there are some some very good people like the Maasai who who you know work with lions and um, do a lot of positive things for lions as, as as well as looking after their farm stock. So anyway, you can understand that's accidental poisoning. But come 2010 and the South African World Soccer World Cup, there was then suddenly a massive increase in um, malicious poisoning. Of vultures and this was for for two reasons one was as you you pointed out yourself Anthony earlier that if someone goes to poach an elephant they shoot the elephant they will then take four hours to cut the tusks out now during that four hour period the vultures are circling overhead the rangers see the vultures think aha there's a carcass there might be a poacher and they then go and swoop down and and uh, catch the poachers. So the poachers have understood that actually the vultures are giving them away. Um, so they thought, well, the yeah, best thing to do is kill the vultures. Then it won't be a problem for me. Um, so that was the start of it with elephants. And then it actually progressed to rhino as well. Um, rhino poaching used to be simply done by shooting. Um, and that was bad enough. But they've changed... Uh, not all, but a lot of the rhino poaching now is done by poison food. So they'll take either um, carrot uh, peelings or cabbage and lace it with poison and then poison the rhino and basically walk beside it until it falls over and then take the horn off. And so basically, and, and the reason for that is that the gunshot um, used to kill the rhino previously could be detected and again the rangers could find out so poisoning has become safer to them but the end result has been that you then have a rhino carcass which is poisoned and of course any carcass yeah. that's, that's yeah. sitting around the vultures are going to come and eat so in that situation it, it's a, a collateral damage to the vultures 
it may benefit the poachers mm. themselves anyway. But but yes, we have all these terrific, terrible things going on. And let me just put it in context. There are eleven species of uh, sorry, uh, yeah, eleven species of vulture in um, in in Africa. And of those, um, there are seven that are either endangered or critically endangered. So the, the Cape vulture, the Lapid vulture, and the Egyptian vulture are all endangered species, whereas the white-headed and the hooded vulture are critically endangered. And I'm separating those two out for a start because those two species are anticipated to be extinct in 2027. That's four years' time. Okay, and we're not talking 20 years away, it's four years' time. There's also the whiteback vulture and the Rupel's vulture. Now, all of those four species there, there are less than 5,000 individuals left in the wild. That means that each of those is rarer than a black rhinoceros. We all know about the plight of the black rhinoceros. Mm -hmm. How many people know there are four species of vulture in Africa that are in a worse state than, than the rhinoceros? And as I said before, you know, they're not mature until they're five or six. They only lay one egg a year. They only rear one, one chick every other year. Um, and they're in a desperate, desperate plight. So how did I get involved? Well, as I say, I was traveling out there. I was introduced to Vault Pro. Um, I did some work with the International Center of Birds of Prey at Newant here, Jemima Parry Jones, myself, and Holly Kale, her curator, and Adam Block, her general manager. We went out there and uh, did some teaching. Um, I was teaching about rehabilitating birds so that basically when they came into care, they got looked after better. They got hopefully some diagnostics done so that those that were fixable could get back to the wild quickly. Um, uh, Holly was talking about artificial incubation and I was talking about rearing neonate vulture chicks and so on and so forth and, and, and Mima and Adam were also contributing to the teaching process. So we kicked that off with that and that was one January time and during the January period, um, we were there for about 10 days and during that period they had 23 injured wild vultures brought into care and it really got to me the last the last day, um, a white back vulture, so one of the critically endangered species, with less than five thousand left, came in with a compound fractured humerus, and Valpro phoned their uh, avian veterinary service, which was at the University of Ulsterport, the exotic department, and they were said, "Oh yeah, sure, we can see it. Bring it in three days' time." And I just about threw a wobbly. I mean, you know, the animal's in pain. It's got a compound fracture. There's already infection. And it's a critically endangered species, uh, local fauna and flora. And they they think it's appropriate to leave it three days before it gets treated. Mm -hmm. So I had a chat with the people. And it made me realise that actually, you know, apart from generous well-meaning uh, members of the public doing re rehabilitation and some some veterinary staff as well what we needed to do was to actually train the veterinary profession better so i then produced a number of courses um, rehabilitation for vets uh, diagnostics critical care treatment orthopedic surgery uh, we did some endoscopy as well uh, a whole range of different subjects and we taught those two veterinary surgeons and so i would do a lecture tour i would go to start off at on sport university and then go down to um cape town um and either use a, a veterinary hospital referral hospital down there or the um uh, sandcap uh, penguin uh, rescue organization which is a, a wonderful organization if you're ever in cape town do go and see them um and also durban at the african bird of prey center and and we we did that tour um we did that for three years initially um and it was really really successful we got the cpd approved by the south african veterinary council so that all the vets got their their cpd points um and that was practical teaching that you know for me that was the thing that would really make the difference so basically we had a maximum class size mm -hmm. of 16 every uh, vet present had a cadaver and they worked their way through from simple basic fractures to really complex things within a day um and 
the reality is none of that work is actually complicated and you don't need lots of fancy equipment either so it's cheap it's easy to do and the the outcomes are really dramatic in terms of saving birds and getting them back to the air or if they can't get back out actually saving wings so they can be useful in in cap conservation breeding projects in captivity so mm. we did that and then more recently we've been doing some training on um what to do in a poisoning um, situation. It's not uncommon for rangers and veterinary staff, state veterinary staff usually, to be called to poisoning um, events. Uh, you know, some of these are terrible. Let me just tell you about the, 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 the awful, awful situation. In 2020, in uh, Guinea-Bissau, um, there were 2,000 hooded vultures killed by poisoning and this is a species where there's less than 5,000 anyway and 2,000 were left lost in one event and I know that's the problem that if you've got a carcass mm. or maybe they put three or four carcasses around you can kill a tremendous number of vultures um, horribly quickly and, and mm. to a point where they can't recover so it really is scary. And Neil, what what do you think are potential, you know, solutions long term? What what kind of, okay. if you like, gives you some hope uh, to keep on working <laughs> in this area? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it, it is it is literally that because you look at it and you look at it logically and you say, well, we're just not going to save them. Um, but you have to do what you can. So there are a number of things that are being done. Firstly, and I think probably the most positive thing is um, setting up um, what is referred to as vulture restaurants. So these are safe feeding stations that vultures can use um, and and not get poisoned. Now, just to explain, when a vulture when a vulture is looking for a food with data loggers and everything, GPS trackers, we now know that a vulture may fly 250 kilometers in a day to find a carcass. Yeah. So the, the problem is that even when we have a, a safe feeding station, if they see a poisoned carcass somewhere else, they, they may still get poisoned. But so they started off by setting up these feeding stations and now they've got safe corridors and, and these are going internationally so they're going from one country through to another through to another so they're actually although they can't make the whole country safe they are they're trying to make areas where they can be safe they can be they can feed safely they can be looked after etc etc so that that is the most positive thing um obviously you know we we are helping continue to help um uh by teaching local staff rehabilitation and uh, surgery and so on. One of the other things that's really, really important is setting up um, ex situ arc populations of these endangered vultures. So, you know, it's already been done to an extent in South Africa. For example, Valpro have 180 flight impaired vultures that can't go back to the wild. But the reality is that in Africa, you have lot, you have rampant avian influenza, you have West Nile virus, um, pseudovirus, so all sorts of things going on that can just wipe them out. And if those vultures are yeah. all in one place, yeah. that's yeah. actually, it makes yeah. them very, very vulnerable. So what we need to do is actually set up populations of these species. And it's not just a question of having a dozen vultures. You've actually got to have a genetically diverse, consistently reproductive, self-sustaining population so i've been working with an organization in wales uh, something called the manfred horseman the manfred horseman uh, vulture conservation trust um and i'm one of the trustees it's a charity that's that's been set in 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 mid wales and we've actually been uh, going back to basics we've been taking blood samples we've done dna analysis we've got inbreeding coefficients of each individual bird uh, and we actually hold 10% of the global captive hooded vulture population. Now, remember, hooded vultures are one of the two most endangered species in Africa uh, predicted to be extinct by 2027. So setting up these things and then 
uh, maximizing production, working, and we're working with other organizations throughout Europe um, with bearded vultures and Sinaeus vultures, the European black vulture, and so on. So we're, we're trying to do this and trying to get people to work together so that, um, and we're actually setting up a DNA laboratory at the Horseman Trust so that we can actually um, invite DNA samples from other vulture keepers, whether they be zoos or privately owned, doesn't matter, so that we can actually maximize the positive conservation breeding and minimize the effect of some of the genetic bottlenecks that some of these species have gone through. So that's the other aspect of it is actually creating these long-term sustainable populations so that if the worst does happen, if we do leave some, either of those two species, the white-headed and the hooded, that actually there are at least some in captivity that if we, if we then reach a point where the African environment is safe for them, they can then go mm. back out again. Mm. To maybe finish with a story of hope, I, I didn't realise that you'd spent so much time at Slimbridge, but of course Peter Scott was famous for saving the Nini goose from Hawaii and he yep. bred it until yep. it was suitable to take them back into Hawaii. So it's definitely an important part at the end that we do protect the vultures that we do yes. have to make sure that we have something, um, you know, like Noah's Ark to, to put these species back into where, right. they, where they yeah. belong. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, there's there's risk to them in the UK with AI and so on, but that's the whole point. You have some in the UK, some in Europe, some in America, some in Africa, mm. so that overall, even yeah. if you lose one or two yeah. of those colonies, you still have enough to to affect a, re, yeah. a, a reintroduction at some point if you need to. Neil, it's been great listening to you. It is a sad story. I, I am a man of hope, so I hope we can turn the African situation around in the way that we seem to be uh, turning the Asian situation around because these are majestic birds. I was in um, Canada and in uh, Florida at VMX a couple of weeks ago and to see turkey vultures flying, it, it's a, a beautiful sight. It is. It's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, for me, any bird flying, but but the, the vultures and the condors as well, you know, they're such big, majestic birds. And they play mm. such a vital role in the ecosystem, um, and uh, you know we really do need, as a as a humanity, we need to look after wildlife and to maintain our biodiversity and and you know prevent the loss of any further species. It's really important. And for those of you uh, listening who don't know, WWT is one of our major bird uh, charities. It's the Wildlife and Wetland Trust. Slimbridge is definitely worth a visit. Absolutely, absolutely. And not just Slimbridge, there are seven seven different centres around yes. the UK. And Slimbridge, uh, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust does tremendous research work, uh, again, uh, across the globe, in Asia, in Africa, mm. the Madagascan pochard, for example, uh, Orchard, yes. a, a species that was... Yeah, was thought to be extinct, but uh, they actually found one pair breeding, and they've been able to go out there and advise yeah. on uh, conservation breeding, and, and you know it's doing quite nicely now. Thank you. And yeah. the um, spoonbill sandpiper the from Russia, sand, sand and, paper, uh, yeah. yeah, and the European cranes that they've reintroduced into into Somerset now. Um, so lots of fantastic, really, really good work that is done that really makes a difference. So uh, a, a good organisation to support mm. certainly. We have one very close to us at Martin Mia, which is a few miles yeah. away from where yeah. I live. So, uh, yeah, and I, I, I think I started, must have been one of their first ever visitors when they opened up in the early 70s. I used to jump on the bus from Liverpool and go out and spend the day yeah. bird watching Good. around there. Good so, for you. Uh, Good for you. Well done. We, yeah. we will yeah. have to, if I'm in the neighbourhood, Neil, we can have a... a a few hours at Slimbridge, that would be very, very good. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Great. That would be a, a good thing to look forward to. Yeah, Neil, thank you so much. And and thank you for all the really important work you're doing, both, you know, on the ground in Africa, but also in this advocacy work you're doing because individuals are important, but changing, you know, um the way that people think in government yeah. and also in industry is is so important as well so uh, thank you and and carry on the good work thank you every single person can make a difference though actually being aware that south african government is not protecting the wildlife in the way that they should be 
as the owners of ESCOM and, and you know, uh, sharing those thoughts with other people and publicizing the plight of, of birds mm. that are suffering elsewhere in the world is really important. So please do your bit, all of you. Because as vets, if we're not going to be shouting out for this, uh, we can't expect the bankers and the lawyers to do it, can we? They won't. They won't, no. Mm. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, thank you for Pleasure. all the, as I say, the, the great work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Take care, Anthony. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Anthony Chadwick from the Webinar Vest, and this has been another episode of Vet Chat. Take care.